Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Benefits of Automation in Medical Laboratories. I am Jennifer Woods of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Abbott Diagnostics. To learn more, visit abbott.com. Now let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speakers, Anne Milne, Biochemistry Laboratory Manager at Aberdeen Royal Infirmary, and Paul Drew, Senior Chief Biomedical Scientist and Hematology Laboratory Manager at Aber Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. For a complete biography on our speakers, please visit the Biography tab at the top of your screen. Anne and Paul, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, for that introduction. So today we're going to speak about the, the benefits of automation in the medical laboratories. As introduced, my name is Paul Drew and I'm the Haematology Laboratory Manager. And I'm Anne Milne. I'm the Laboratory Manager in Clinical Biochemistry at Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. To set the scene, this, we thought we'd start off by letting you know where we are. So here's a map of the UK showing where Scotland is. Aberdeen is located up on the northeast coast in the Grampian region. The Grampian region is the largest area in Scotland, um, in region in Scotland. That the area of the region is 3,320 square miles, which translates into 180,000 square kilometres. The region, Aberdeen is known as the Granite City and has been known as the oil capital of Europe. The region has a population of approximately 600,000 people and is served by NHS Grampian. If we just zoom in, a little closer on the region to give you an idea of the geography. You can see here in this slide Aberdeen Royal Infirmary located on the right hand side of the picture and Dr. Gray's Hospital located up in the northwest of the region. The Grampian NHS region consists of those two hospitals but also has around 92 GP practices as well as outpatient clinics dotted throughout the area. To give you an idea of the geography and the distances involved here, the distance between Aberdeen and Elgin is approximately 66 miles, which is about 106 kilometres. That maybe doesn't seem very far in distance terms, but when you couple that with sometimes inclement weather conditions that we see in Scotland, the logistics of travelling around the area can be quite challenging. So GP samples in the region who are sending samples to Aberdeen Royal Infirmary on a daily basis face this challenge. We meet this by having a courier service that collects blood samples from all of the 92 GP practices in the region at the end of the GP's working day, and they transfer to Aberdeen Royal Infirmary, which means that our departments, both haematology and clinical biochemistry, are receiving the bulk of our workload at the end of the working day, our core working hours, between 5 p.m. and 8 p.m., which does give its own challenges. So if we look at NHS Grampian in a bit more detail, starting with Aberdeen Royal Infirmary, the hospital was first established in 1739 and then moved to its current site in 1936. But it was officially opened by the Duke and Duchess of York at the time. We then joined the NHS in 1948. So since then, and until now, there's been a number of extensions, new builds, etc., added to the hospital site, which now sees us in a 125-acre site. We're now at a 1,000-bed teaching hospital, and we provide all the major services, including hemophilia centre, oncology, burns, and a and &E. And we're bestowed major trauma centre and been the first one to open in Scotland in 2018. 
Also in site, we have a, a children's hospital, a paediatric hospital, a maternity hospital, a neonatal unit, and also, also a hospital for mental health. We're covering a population of about 600,000. There's also an extensive laboratory directorate within Aberdeen Royal Infirmary, and this consists of microbiology, virology, immunology, genetics, pathology, as well as hematology and biochemistry. The hospital at Dr Gray's in Elgin is a much smaller hospital and has about 190 beds. Services covered include um, orthopaedics, maternity unit, and accident and emergency in general surgery. We have a dedicated satellite laboratory in Elgin, staffed by their own staff. We, we don't transfer staff between Aberdeen and Elgin. So they have their own dedicated satellite laboratory there. And they deliver basic hematology and basic biochemistry. And under the, under the current climate, also COVID testing now, of course, and about to do the flu testing as we move into that season. Any more, any further complicated assays would come down to hematology and biochemistry at Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. If we then now look at the, the hematology and biochemistry departments, and we'll look at these separately, in that they are autonomous departments. We reside in a, a building that was initially erected in the early 1970s. So unfortunately, it's not particularly conducive to a combined blood sciences. So we, ha we are on separate floors within this building. So looking at hematology, we have around 40 full-time staff, and that's made up of uh, biomedical scientists, one clinical scientist, biomedical support workers, and a couple of consultants as well. We also have a number of part-time staff that predominantly cover that busy batch shift period that Anne spoke about between 5 p.m. and 8 p.m. when all the GP samples are arriving. We offer a full 24-hour shift system, so that's uh, loan working from 10 p.m. to 9 a.m. And on average, we analyse about 2,500 full blood counts a day, 800 hematinics, and 350 clotting screens in INRs. We also provide a full specialist coagulation repertoire as well. Added to this, we also have a busy hematic, cytochemistry, and flow cytometry section. Our film review rate was sitting at about 4%, but since we've moved on to new analyzers just recently, I would say that's probably more in the region of 6 to 7% as we get accustomed to the analyzers, but we aim to get that film review rate back down again. So a little bit about biochemistry, similar to Paul's description of haematology, we also work a 24-hour shift system where we have a lone working biomedical scientist working overnight between 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. We have around 51 staff, so we are slightly better staff than haematology, but we have a combination of staff from chemical pathologists, clinical scientists, biomedical scientists, biomedical support workers, and associate practitioners. You can see from that slide there the kind of services that we offer. So as well as routine chemistry and immunoassay services, we also have some specialist chemis chemistry and um, protein section stuff, as well as toxicology. You can see our workload stats there as well. So on average, we're looking at around 3,500 UNE samples, 1,000 glucoses, 450 HbA1Cs, um, 1,200 TSH daily. So it is a very busy department. A little bit about our health healthcare environment. Um, as we are in the northeast of Scotland, this is quite an affluent area, but we do have a diverse population, quite ageing. Anyone who's familiar with the Scottish population will know that we're not really all that keen on the fitness side of things and are, are more of an obese population. We do like the food and the fine things in life, and we like a little drum of whiskey every now and again. This has resulted in of a number of diseases that cause issues in our area, heart disease, dementia, cerebro cerebrovascular disease, lower respiratory disease, and diabetes are very common in our region, and those are the healthcare challenges that we look at. So what are the challenges that we actually face in haematology and biochemistry? And I'm sure these challenges are very familiar to all of you who are actually tuning into this. And that's of staff, financial resources, in time. And although we'll take these uh, separate, they're all very much interrelated as well. Yeah. 
If, if we start off looking at staff, we are lucky and we have a very dedicated and, and loyal workforce within Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. The major turnover of staff is usually down to retirement. And this creates its own challenges, of course, and we're losing an awful lot of experience and expertise. We are lucky that we have a university on the doorstep that provides a biomedical science degree course. But of course, so recruitment isn't an issue as such, but we are recruiting trainee biomedical scientists. So we're never been able to replace that experience and expertise that we're losing. Although we're extremely grateful for the trainees that are coming out of the, the biomedical science degree course. If we look at the, the finances, yeah, and as a laboratory manager, I'm bound to say that, yes, I don't have enough money in my, in my budget. We, we all I'm sure say that. But year on year, we've actually had efficiency savings targets to meet. So they are placed on our budget and we have to try and meet those efficiency savings. This is extremely challenging, as you can imagine, particularly when the workload demands are increasing the whole time. And also, this is where it interrelates with staff, of course, in that uh, we had an exercise several years back where we had to look at our workforce. And this came under the banner of safe, affordable workforce. So we had to look at our workforce and see where we could make some financial savings. Because as we all know, staffing is the main cost in our budgets. So again, this is where we become quite lean when it comes to, to staff and personnel. And of course, we're all involved with silo budgets. So although we might be able to make a, a saving in one particular area, it's extremely difficult to say, well, look, we need to get money back into our budget because we've saved money in orthopedics or in Reno, et cetera. That doesn't often happen, certainly not in the NHS here in, in Scotland. And then we'll look at time. There's so many conflicting demands on our time these days. So yes, we're having to, to train all the trainees that are coming out of university to get them, give them that experience and expertise, but we're also having to provide that essential service to our users as well. And of course, and meet their demands, meet the turnaround times that we're expected to deliver. On top of that, we're all having to look at our own competencies and keep ourselves up to, to speed. And also we have to make sure that our quality management system is in place making sure we're appeasing our external accreditors that uh, come in and have a look around our departments. So, of course, we are all having to do more with less. This kind of just gives you an example. I particularly chose this slide, so it shows hematinics and coagulation samples. So these are samples that are actually needing sample preparation. So they need to be spun offline, they need to be decapped, they need to be recapped. And you can see from here, year on year increases. I did leave the coagulation one in here because it does buck the trend. There is a decrease there. But that, of course, aligns with the point of care analyzers that primary care started using for doing the INR testing. So you can see there is a slight drop there, but still a lot of sample preparation that is required from the staff. If we look just purely at the hematinics, you can see in, in 15 years, our samples have, have risen dramatically. So if you look at ferritins, there's a 78% increase in workload over that period of time. If you look at B12 and folate, we're actually looking at an 80% increase over that period of time. I would love to say that my budget has increased by 80% over that period of time, but unfortunately, no such luck. And again, full blood counts are our mainstay in hematology. Our full blood count uh, samples in 10 years have risen by 18%. So again, Typical year-on-year -year increases on our, our workload, extra demands on the staff, extra demands on the finances. So how, how can we actually, what can we do to actually try and make it easier on ourselves here? And just to continue on from what Paul has highlighted there, these are the workload figures for using these and LFTs in clinical biochemistry in Aberdeen from the last 10 years. And you can see a similar workload increase reflected in our department as as well. So let's just reflect on all of that. As we've described, we have a larger number, number of samples coming into our departments on a daily basis during a busy, short period of the day where our, our core workforce has gone home. If you think about what has to happen to every sample, and I'm sure in your labs it's exactly the same, when a sample arrives in the department, it has to go under the pre-analytical checks. So we're then looking at, has the sample been labelled appropriately? Are the patient demographics for that sample correct? Is it in the right tube type? Is it the right tube for the assays that are requested on the sample? 
And once having established all that information is correct, we then have to order it into our laboratory information management system before we can then even proceed towards thinking about analysing the sample. In clinical biochemistry, and sure, in the same in every clinical biochemistry department, GPs tend to think about what they're asking and ask for more, more assays on one sample than necessarily on an analyzer. So samples need to get moved from one analyzer to another, depending on which tests are requested. Um, so you have to think about that when you're getting your sample ready for an analysis to make sure it goes to the correct platform. Samples then, obviously, once they're typed into the laboratory information system, in biochemistry, we need to centrifuge samples, decap the sample before presenting it to the instrument. And then once the analysis is complete, we're doing that process in reverse, where the samples are taken off of the instrument, recapped, and filed. Filed in a system where you can, re you can refine the sample if you need to. If you think about all of the manual steps that are involved there, all the touch time on the samples, there's quite a lot of few health and safety concerns too, where staff are taking tops of potentially high-risk samples and causing aerosols to be created and exposure to high risks. Obviously, using the automation makes all of this so much easier, makes the work managing of that work so much easier, and as well as the health and safety concerns, streamlining the whole process and allowing us to manage far more work than we ever could pre-automation steps. In biochemistry as well, if we think of things post-analytically, although we have a wide repertoire in clinical biochemistry at Aberdeen, we don't do every test. And quite often we receive requests for specialist testing that need to get sent off to a referral department. So, in an average week, that would be about 300 samples that we're sending away from clinical biochemistry. Prior to having automation, those samples had to be searched out by a member of staff before alcohols were prepared for sending away with all the necessary labelling. And of course, there's a minefield of error there where someone maybe chooses the wrong tube or labels up an alcohol wrongly, um, leading to certain safety and quality concerns round about that as well. A GP may often add on a, a test onto a sample that's already in the lab as well. So it, to save the patient having to come back into the GP surgery to be re-bled. So if he phones up and adds on an additional request, then that Scott sample has to be found from a cold storage and put back onto automation. And that's in addition to things like reflex testing and, as we, and reruns that we do routinely. So as you can imagine, all of that, when it's manually done, creates such a lot of work that can be easily helped and um, modified using mo automation to free up staff to do more skilled tasks. The COVID-19 pandemic has introduced a whole new lot of challenges for us, as I'm sure it has for all of you watching this presentation. We are, although our sample numbers didn't increase on, on the grounds of the COVID pandemic, we've had to think of loads of other issues around keeping our staff safe and trying to maintain social distancing. So by using our automation sensibly, we're able to allow staff to, to move more freely in the department, further apart from each other, um, and that's helped us to keep them safe. So I, I quite enjoy putting this uh, slide together because it's my own personal timeline of automation when, from when I started in the laboratory. And although making me feel absolutely ancient when I look at it, because it spans across six decades, it is quite interesting because it shows how automation has changed over time and how we've benefited from that change in automation. So if we start off in the late 60s and 70s, before I joined the lab, I'd hasten to add at this point in time, um, what was required, staff would have a, a wander across to the, the ward in their lab coats and a, a bit of rubber tubing in their pocket. And they, they would then mouth pipette blood, which is quite incredible when you think about it, and do the, the haemoglobin white cell count, red cell count, using counting chambers as well. They even used cocaine for counting platelets. If that all got too much, then of course you could lie down in the darkened room, which was required for doing our microbiological hematinic assays. So in 1979, when I did first join the, the lab, I would love to say I was five when I joined that, but I think you might see through that one. But when I first joined the lab in 1979, we had one analyzer which provided seven parameters. So that was a white count, a red count, a haemoglobin, and an MCV. And from that, the MCH, the MCH, and hematocrit were then calculated. If you wanted to have a platelet count, you needed a separate analyzer, and a sample dilution was then required for actually doing your platelet count. So again, more manual requirements. 
But we have moved to radioisotopes for doing our hematinics now, moving, moving away from the microbiological ones. And of course, the results were printed out onto a report card. You then had to take that report card and manually transcribe those results into the patient record. We would then photocopy that record and send that result out to the ward on the photocopy. So, yeah, a lot of work was involved in, in dealing with our, our sample workload. In the mid-80s, we moved to another analyzer which uh, delivered 12 parameters, including a platelet count, but still no differential at this point in time. And I remember when we first got this analyzer in, still brings a smile to my face when I think about it, because only the laboratory manager and her deputy at the time were allowed to use this analyzer okay, during the day. Night shift was a different matter, but during the day, only they were allowed to use the analyzer. And of course, but the novelty soon wore off and we all managed to get our hands on this. And boy, did you have to keep your wits about you when you were doing this. If you can imagine, your rack was mixing the samples on your right-hand side, on the left-hand side was your printer where you had to put in your report cards for printing the results out. You take the sample off the mixer, take the cap off, introduce it to the analyzer, let it take another quarter of the blood. You would then make your blood film, cap on, put that into the, the sample rack, and then you would repeat that process remembering to take out the results that were printed out and put another report card in for the, the next set of, of results. So you, you felt like an octopus at times, just waving your hands about manically. But of course, you also had to keep your wits about you because you had to remember the sample number that you had in your hand was always two more than the counter on the analyzer itself. So if you are distracted, yeah. <laughs> One or two mistakes were probably made at that time. And of course, you would then be looking for a set of results and the report card wasn't there because you'd forgot to put a report card in the printer. Yeah, it was carnage when you kind of look back at it, but we, we survived, yeah. And then in uh, late eighties, we then got the inclusion of a three-part differential and that was neutrophils, lymphocytes and mononucleons. Okay. But of course, the big change in the late eighties was the advent of the laboratory computer of the limb system. So no longer manual transcription of results. We then moved to the, the mid nineties and we had another analyzer which then produced a five part differential, the differential that we all know and love to this day, of course. And I love the unique selling point of these analyzers when I was looking back, because it was designed for walk away automation. And it, and it did exactly that. I mean, it was quite revolutionary for the departments at the time in that you had a rack that would take 10 samples. You would load that rack on one side of the analyzer, it would take the rack through, analyze all 10 samples, and eject the rack on the, the, the other side. So you'd have an input side and an output side. And of course, you could load up to 10 racks on the, the input side. So that was 100 samples that you could place on an analyzer and actually walk away from. So yeah, it's quite a, a, a big step there. We then took the, the leap into uh, a fully automated track in 2008. And you can see from the, the picture there, what, what it's the, the layout of the, of the track. And what we had at the front there was a, a sample manager. And on the sample manager, you could load 100 samples in a tray. And the input lane there, we had two trays. So that's 200 samples that you could actually load on the analyzer or on the sample manager at uh, any one time. Robots would then pick up the samples from that trays and deliver it to the automated track. It would then deliver those samples to the appropriate module or analyzer. And connected to the track, we had four full blood count analyzers. We had two automated slide maker stainers. We then had a, a centrifuge unit for spinning down our serum samples. And then we had an immunoassay analyzer for doing our B12s, folates, and ferritins. Once the samples were completed, they would come back into the sample manage, into, sorry, back into the sample manager to be stored. Or if a further test was required, for example, uh, if it was a viscosity or an IM slide test or a mladeo parasite, for example, it would go to a dedicated area in that sample manager. So a member of staff could come along, pick out those samples for IMs or the samples for malaria, no longer having to search through a tray trying to find the appropriate sample. And also this could all be directed from the individual sitting in front of the track there, looking at the results, and they decided that maybe, for example, we missed a blood film and wanted to order a blood film. By ordering a blood film against that sample number, the sample manager would then find that sample, 
put it back on the track, and it would be directed to the slide maker Steiner to make that, that film. So again, we had a lot of ability to reflex and made things a lot more manageable. And we eliminated a lot of manual steps at that point in time by introducing the, the automated track. And before we, we jump to, to 2020 and where we are currently, Anne will come back in with the, the biochemistry. Yeah, obviously, my um, experience in the lab is a lot shorter than Paul's because I am quite a lot younger than him. But from my experience of working in biochemistry over the last 20 years, when I first started in the department, the lab was spread over lots of small rooms with specialist areas. So we had a chemistry area, an amino acid area, we had toxicology areas. In the order to facilitate the implementation of the automation, which in our lab looked very similar to the picture on Paul's slide there, um, a lot of walls had to come down and a lot of space had to be made. So our first generation track was introduced slightly earlier than 2008, but was of a very similar description as to Paul has given. We had a sam two sample monitors, um, we had three chemistry analysers, online centrifugation, two amino acid analysers, and similar to what Paul is describing as well, you could um, configure your sample monitor to put the samples into unload trays that made them easy to find or easy to pass on to the next stage in the process. Moving on to where we are now, and building on to that experience, we actually just have installed our third incarnation of an automated track. Um, our new systems, build on what has already been possible in terms of online centrifugation, decapping. And we now have more advanced modules, such as there's a cup recognition module that will look at the sample that's been received and decide if the top is the right colour for the type of blood sample that is required for the assays that have been requested. Now, this is a massive bonus for us because quite often at the GP surgery end, if a mistake has been made in labelling up a sample, we might not always have detected it at our specimen reception, bearing in mind the amount of workload that we were handling at any one time. So further progress that has been made on the new automation, things that are new to us in this last year with our new incarnation of automation, is looking more at the post-analytical. So samples going back to cold storage units, online cold storage units. So really, the touch time for the sample is minimal. The, the samples are loaded on. Every step is taken care of by the automation. I described already how we send referral samples to referral labs. So the new generation of our automation has got modules that allow aliquots to be made online. So this, the aliquoter unit will generate a daughter tube, it will produce a, a label, and so it will label the daughter tube and the aliquot will be placed in it. So then all the member of staff needs to do is access that sample, take it away and send it on to the next lab. There's so much time saved by removing repetitive manual tasks, and that is what the automation does for you. It also lets us have staff, as we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, both haematology and biochemistry have loan working members of staff who work overnight. They are able to process far more inpatient samples that come during an evening, during a night shift, than if they had to do everything manually. And as Paul has described, if they decide there's a rerun to be done or an issue with an instrument, they can schedule all of that from one location rather than having to move around the lab, getting samples and hunting things down. Another added benefit is that because we know the automation will, will robustly process a certain number of samples within a certain time, we can predict our turnaround times more accurately. So if a GP wants to know if his blood sample that he sent in on a Monday afternoon will be ready by a Tuesday morning, we can give him a, an honest answer to that question that yes, it probably will be. So let's go back to that previous slide again. Just to, to build on that as well, from a hematology perspective, uh, we've tried to eliminate some of the steps that uh, we were still having to do even with our previous automated track. And that was look, mainly looking at the, the pre and post analytical. So we've introduced a, a recapper onto the track. We've introduced a, a decapper on the track as well. So for all those hematinic samples that we're having to, to recap and people complaining about their thumbs and having to stick all these caps on, that's no longer an issue. Um, we also made the decision to track our coagulation analyzers as well. So you'll see there's a, a lady in the distance there and suitably face masked as well, shall we say, in that area. And this picture was taken about uh, three months ago now. But just in the last six weeks, 
we've introduced our two coagulation analyzers into that area as well. So samples no longer have to be spun offline. They can be spun on the track, although we do still spin, spin the specialist coagulation offline. So again, just eliminating a lot of manual steps there. One of the other things, again, because this is fairly new to us, as you can see, I mean, we only started going live on, what was that, three weeks ago in hematology with the automated track, not long before that for, for biochemistry. So this is very new automation to ourselves as well. And we're still to build on this automation. Another thing that we'll bring in then, hopefully end of this year, beginning of next year, will be a, a refrigerated storage module. So those samples will automatically go from the track into the storage module. Again, these can be recalled if we wanted to reflex samples, but the, ad the added advantage there is we can set timelines. So for example, after two days, we can say that all the EDTA samples for full blood counts can be removed. So they will automatically be removed into an autoclave bag, ready for the sport worker just to pick up and dispose of. So no longer are we having to go into fridges, empty rack after rack of samples into an autoclave. The automation will now deliver that for us. We also will intend to have, uh, well, we do have two monitors in each of the laboratories as well. One monitor will show you the track and, the, and how things are behaving, how the analyzers are behaving, etc. So you can see that it's quite visible from anywhere within the laboratory. The other monitor will show us our, our turnaround times and will highlight if we're, we're in danger of, of breaching the turnaround time for a &E or for, for AMIA. Also, with the tracker we have, we now have priority lanes, so we can actually prioritise our a &E samples. Under the old system, we were unable to do that, but we can pro truly prioritise our a &E samples now. So, just... so what we've done is we've fully automated the, the technical process, we've automated the, the pre-analytical, and we've managed to automate the post-analytical process as well. But we still felt in hematology and biochemistry there was an area that we could improve upon. And that was when samples were being delivered to the laboratory. So our, basically our, our sample reception area. Up until about six months ago, each sample that was, that was delivered to the laboratories came in an individual plastic sample bag. That bag had to be opened up. We would then scan the barcode label that was on the sample. That would bring up the patient demographics. We would check that against the what was being shown on the computer. And at that point, we would then relabel the sample. So we'd have a, a unique laboratory identifier barcode label, and we would put that in the sample. That would then have to be scanned, and then we'd order the tests. So you can see a lot of manual repetitive steps involved there in booking in uh, samples. We had discussed run-through labeling for a number of years, but because of the limitations of our, our limb system, we were unable to take that step. But due to the perseverance of our laboratory IT colleagues in conjunction with our, our limbs provider, we finally managed to crack that. So what happens now is, we, and we introduced this just in primary care in the first instance, so we haven't moved on to secondary care yet. This is just for primary care and the GPs. So by using the label that is produced in the GP surgery, when that comes into the laboratory now, we can scan that label. We don't have to relabel the sample anymore. So hence the, the run through labeling. So you can see we've already managed to eliminate a couple of steps there. And all you think, well, it's a couple of steps. That's not going to make a huge amount of difference. When you think that's a couple of steps on a thousand samples, that's a considerable amount of time that we are actually saving and being able to utilize that stuff better. But by moving to run through labeling, that then led us on to a, a significant improvement that would benefit not just the laboratories, but also the users of the service, so the GP surgeries themselves. So you can see in front of you there, we have a, a system, and there's four cradles there. And in the far cradle, you see there's a rack that will contain samples, red insert. Behind that rack, there's a, a black sensor. And next to the, the rack, there's a, a PC and monitor, which is linked into our, our, our limb system. So we made the decision in July, July this year, that uh, we invited 12 GP practices or GP surgeries to be involved in a, a pilot site. These were selected quite carefully because it was the, the, the biggest numbers that were coming in from those practices. So the big hitters, as we called them. So we invited them to participate in the, the, the pilot study, and they were all extremely keen to be involved in this. So what we did is we delivered two of the cradles units there, numerous racks, 
in one of those black sensor units to each practice. The reason we had to give them two of these cradles was we still needed to split out the hematology samples from the biochemistry samples, and that these were couriered in and then delivered to the appropriate department. As we said, we're on different floors, so we don't have a common sample reception at the moment. So we needed to be able to separate that. So of course we went very, he says with a smile on his face, we went very high tech on this. So you can see the rackets on the cradle there has a red insert. Red means hematology. For the biochemistry samples, we introduced a green insert. So from the GP surgery, it was quite simple, red hematology, green was biochemistry. So if we go back to the, the GP surgery, all they then have to do is when they take that sample, they would pass it in front of that black sensor unit and place it in the rack, which is sitting in the cradle. So with an appropriate rack, be it the hematology or the biochemistry one. When that sample is placed in the rack, it automatically flashes or, or lights up that sample position. And what it's doing there is it's making an association with that sample and patient demographics to that particular position on that RFID rack. Okay, so this is the, the important point there. Each one of those racks can take up to 60 samples. So there's the big saving in itself there for the GP practice. That's 60 less plastic sample bags that is going into that rack, no longer required. So eliminating plastic waste. And interestingly, before we started to deliver this, we were beginning to see a lot more phone calls coming into the department saying, do we really have to put a, a separate bag, separate sample into a separate bag? Everybody being conscious of the, 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 the climate, of course. So. That was why they were so keen to buy into this process, the fact that we were eliminating plastic waste. And you can see from the, the GP surgery, we weren't asking to do any more than what they were doing. Instead of placing a sample in a bag, they were simply passing it in front of the sensor and placing it in the rack. But you could see the advantages because of that waste of plastic, and eliminating plastic waste. Our couriers will then come along, pick up those racks and deliver them to appropriate departments. So they would come into the hematology, and you can see the setup we have here in that we have four cradles. That could be scaled up, it could be scaled down depending on the, on the workload. But we have four cradles here. So when the samples are delivered, we can place four, four rats into these cradles. We then go to the, the PC, and we would, in effect, accept those samples in. And within seconds, every single sample that is within those rack is booted into our limb system. So you can see how this is quite groundbreaking for us in that we have eliminated so many manual steps at sample reception for these samples that are being delivered in this particular way. As I said, we introduced this to 12 pilot sites in July. We then rolled that out to another 24 sites in August, again, those that were sending in the most samples. We felt there was no point in sending a sample to a GP surgery, and there are some of them who are sending in maybe two samples a day we didn't think it, it, it required it. But we still have some racks that we can put out if we decide to increase the, the number still. So that's now 36 practices out of the 92 that have this system in place. And although that's only 40% of the practices, that's still over 60% of the workload that's now coming into the department is now booked in in this way. And if we look at this graph here, this just highlights just how many samples are coming in from primary care in hematology and biochemistry. So you can see 1,500, averaging 1,500 for hematology, about two, two and a half thousand for, for biochemistry. But even allowing for 60% of that coming in in this fashion, you're seeing that's about 900 hematology samples and about 13, 1,400 biochemistry samples that are coming in this way. So that's over 2,000 sample bags that we're not having to use anymore. So that's a, a huge saving in, in, in waste and also a, a financial saving to the organisation as well in disposing of that plastic waste. But also that's also 2,000 samples that are being booked in within seconds of coming into the department. So you can see what a, a huge difference that has made. And we're very slick now when it comes to the sample reception area. With regards to the run-through labelling, you can also see there that 99.2% of samples are now received with a label. So even though they're not in this system, we still have that not having to relabel that sample. So again, a huge bonus for the laboratory. Yeah, just to continue on from what Paul said there, um, the, 
implementation of pre-analytical automation gives additional benefits for biochemistry as well. Once the systems are fully implemented, as, as Paul indicated, we're still in the early pilot stages of getting this implemented. But we will have the facility where we can predict, we can have a look on the system to see what's being put in at the GP end so that we can confidently know what kind of workload is coming into the lab that evening. So we can decide maybe we want to have another instrument, a chemistry analyzer ready to go, more, ready, more staff available, or if somebody can't be here because they're off sick, do we need to replace that member of staff? Actually, no, the workload tonight is quite light, so we'll be okay. So there's massive advantage, advantages for us as well. So just to conclude... And if I can just come in one second, there's yeah. one thing I did forget to add there was, we also have the facility when we put it into that cradle to create work lists as well. Because immunology is on the same floor as haematology, they come in in the same rack. So how do you identify which samples are haematology and which samples are immunology? So by creating an immunology work list, we would simply click on that work list and every sample that was designed to go to immunology would flash. So we would quite easily just highlight those samples, pick those samples that are flashing, and they would set them aside for immunology. Or if we wanted to set up a work list for, say, malarial parasites or IM slide tests, again, by simply clicking on that work list, if we wanted to prioritise those, it would flash on those samples of malarial parasites. So, again, we could pick those samples out and prioritise them. So, again, it's just improving the efficiencies within the, the department. Sorry, Anne. Definitely. And I think, as you and power through our presentation, that is the main conclusion that we would come to. We are able to manage ever-increasing workloads with our automation. Because we have just upgraded our automation this year, we've got built-in flexibility now for the next 10 years. And assuming our numbers keep on going the way they have been, we'll be able to cope with that workload with the staff that we've got. We can improve our our turnaround times because we can't predict what's going on. We can see when samples are going, as Paul described, using our dashboards, we can see if a sample is going to breach your turnaround time. So that's improving our quality and decreasing error rates. Things like cup recognition help us so much. And that was quite a common error that we had in biochemistry before, was that a glucose tube would be labelled wrongly and analysed on a gold top sample. We wouldn't always pick that up at specimen reception. So using the automation cleverly is letting that happen. And so therefore we're maximising our efficiency. And this allows us to utilise our skilled staff to do the skilled tasks that they have been trained to do. Thank you, Anne and, Anne and Paul, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you would like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Now let's get started. Our first question is, which quality guidelines do you have to follow and how is automation helping with them? Okay, I'll take this one, Paul. Um, labs in NHS Grampian are all um, accredited by UCAS, which is the UK Accreditation Service. We are accredited against ISO 15189 standard, and that's the 2012 revision. Um, obviously, the UCAS accreditation process follows every aspect of our service, from pre-analytical um, requirements to do the, the actual assay results we're producing and reports that are going out. As we've described, um, using automation just gives us a far better um, handle on what is actually happening in the lab um, in terms of reducing errors, in terms of the pre-analytical steps that we've described, wrong tube types, for example, samples that are not appropriately barcoded won't be read by automation. But above and beyond that, we can use the automation to help us so much more with quality issues. For example, audit. So using the middleware, we haven't really spoken very much during the presentation about the middleware that we use with the automated systems that we have. So the current the middleware allows you to do much more in terms of monitoring. So auditing, for example, how many samples you're analyzing, what workloads are, you know, how many, how many UNE samples you're getting requested, um, what your turnaround time is, are you achieving your target turnaround times as Paul touched on for a and &E samples or emergency short turnaround time samples. Um, also, you can use your middleware for loads of other quality applications, such as looking at your IQC trend analysis, um, instrument to instrument comparison, which is a 
big thing for the UCAS accreditation. And also, we haven't really touched very much on the lab at Dr. Gray's, but at Dr. Gray's Hospital Lab in Elgin, we are on the same um, automation, so we have the same middleware. So we can look at their QCs on their analyzers, and we can compare how they are performing against the analyzers at Aberdeen, both for haematology and for clinical biochemistry. And it's important from a UCAS point of view as well. If you have a patient who's admitted to Dr. Bayes and then transferred to ERI, you want to know that the results are compatible. So all through our assessment visit, visits, the automation have helped us achieve our accreditation status. Thank you, Anne. And it looks like we have one more question here. You started very early with automation in 2008. Why did you decide to automate so early? Any recommendation for someone who wants to start automating now? I think that sounds like a question for me, and so I'll take that one. I don't think it will happen in 2008 for you, as you've frankly said. So, <laughs> so why did we go in 2008? I took over the laboratory manager's post in haematology in 2005. So we started the procurement process the following year for, for the new analyzers that we wanted to go to. Uh, and I always remember being the lone voice at the time saying that we should we should actually automate. And I was trying to make the point that it wasn't about just looking for what we needed now. This was about trying to future-proof for the next 10 years, because quite often that procurement process is for a 10-year plus. <laughs> in this case, it was 12 years before we actually went to or finally got analyzers back in again. So you do have to have that long-term approach to what is required. One of my mantras, of course, as well, was making sure we got the right person to do the right job and, and upskilling staff as well. So I didn't want to have biomedical scientists raking through racks trying to find a sample, which happened on a daily basis because somebody would come in and just put a sample down in the first space they could find in a rack. And inevitably, that was the sample you needed for a, a blood film or for a, a, a PV, for example. So you'd spend hours trying to find that sample. So that was, wasn't efficient use of staff time. So, and again, there was so much more, we're saying increasing demand on staff time. So again, this was all about getting the right person doing the right job. So by automating a lot of that process, we had the biomedical support workers actually running the automated track. We had them doing the maintenance on the analyzers as well. So that was freeing up the, the BMS staff to do the, the technical side of things, the paperwork side of things that were required for, for UCAS, et cetera. So it was all about that mantra of getting the right person to do the right job. And an interesting story, of course, was we had one member of staff who uh, was in our, our, our twilight, like the cell, in our twilight years, shall we say, of uh, looking forward to retirement. And of course, that was the last thing she wanted was an automated track coming into the department. It did ter terrify her to a degree. And again, she didn't think it was required. She thought it was a, a bit of overkill there. And I remember two years later at our retirement function, her coming up to me and saying, you were right, you know, that was the right thing to do. And for, for that to come from that individual, it was quite a, it kind of took me back, I'd have to say, before, for this individual to actually come back and say that to me. So again, you could see that we had the buy-in from the staff because they could see the benefits of automating that process. So for MD, it's thinking, I mean, is it the right thing to do for me or is it not? Just have a look around you. I mean, how much how much manual tasks or repetitive tasks are you actually having to do? Have you got the staff to actually provide to do those manual tasks, or can you utilise your staff better? And again, it depends on the workload that's coming in, etc. As well, but I would say, I mean, don't be afraid of automation. We've certainly embraced automation since since two thousand eight, and we, we continue to embrace it. As you can see with the, the new system, with the, the sample exception the more we can do to, to help staff and minimize the stress, because all staff are under stress these days because of the increasing demands on them. So the more that we can automate and allow them more free time to do the things that are necessary is, is a bonus as far as I'm concerned. And an additional recommendation to that is just to not be limited by what you know. Automation makes anything possible. You know, like we're seeing this with our latest generation of automation. Things like putting third party analyzers onto your automated track is now possible. And you can use the middleware for looking at QCs from for analyzers that are not even on the track. Anything is possible. So it is like your recommendation for moving forward with automation. Dream the lab that you would always want. 
and see if you can build it with automation. So don't be scared, as Paul said. That's a, that's a very good point that Anne's made there is, I mean, don't be campered with what you know. I remember, I mean, I, I felt I was being quite visionary at the time, thinking we needed to go to an automated track. And we had a site visit to a hospital in Barcelona, which kind of blew all our minds in just what they were providing on a fully automated track. So from my vision of maybe having a, a little wee dinky track, it kind of moved on somewhat, shall we say, because I, I've got that opportunity to do it. So again, if you are coming to procurement, get your, get your providers to take you to areas that would be of interest to you. Expand your, your knowledge. It might not be right for you, but at least see what's available out there. It might grow a seed in you. So, get a wish you. list ready. Yeah, get your wish list ready. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Anne and Paul. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Just thank you for, for watching, and I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. Yeah, and, and don't be afraid of automation. It, it works for us. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Anne and Paul, for your time today and for your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Abbott Diagnostics, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speakers via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.